All right, I'm going to give a welcome. So welcome, everyone. Welcome uh, from the Indian Arts Commission. I'm Stephanie Haynes, Arts Education and Accessibility Program Manager. Um, this is the third webinar in a series we're doing called Arts for All, Accessibility in the Arts. And um, this webinar today is Beyond the Front Steps, Developing Program Accessibility. We previously talked about how to plan for accessibility, um, how to all the, the legal kind of ADA related rules of accessibility. And we talked about some of the basic um, customer service, front of house and physical accessibility uh, that all goes with accessibility in the arts. Today, we wanna go a little deeper and talk about programming accessibility, meaning that uh, going beyond the ramp going beyond the front door and the bathrooms, how can your programs uh, be designed to be inclusive of people with disabilities and be a great experience for everyone in your community? And so again, we are so grateful to have invited our friends at ArtMix to put together this webinar and present their expertise Art Mix based here in Indianapolis, serving the whole community, uh, the arts community and the disability community and all the places they intersect. I don't know, that's probably not your motto, but maybe it should be. That was, that was pretty good. Um, and so we're so happy to have Art Mix here. I will um, hand it over to Britt to do another welcome from Art Mix and hand it off to the presenters. Welcome, Britt. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, when we have our next strategic planning meeting to talk about updating the mission and vision, I'll keep that one in mind and submit it to the board. I like it. Um, welcome. My name is Britt Sutton. I am CEO of ArtMix, and we're really excited to present today. We have a wonderful group of panelists. I'm going to have them go through and, and introduce themselves, um, but it's going to be a great day. I'm also going to present a little bit of information from our friends at Easter Seals. Unfortunately, they weren't able to be here today, but we'll talk about how to rent adaptive and uh, a technology if you would like to include that in your own programming. So without further ado, Lydia, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Lydia Campbell Mayer, and I'm the VP of programs here at ArtMix. I use she, her pronouns. Did you want to introduce everyone first? Or do you want me to jump right in? Okay. Courtney, you want to introduce your, introduce yourself and then we'll have Lydia get started. Okay. Hi guys. I'm Courtney Clark. I am the current secretary of self advocates in Indiana. I have cerebral palsy and a service dog named Shasta. Thank you, Courtney. All right, Lydia, take it away. All right. So I'm going to share my screen here. Everybody can see that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I'm just going to introduce you a little bit to ArtMix and then talk about um, programming. Um, so this is just a slide with a snapshot of our programs in action. Um, at ArtMix, we serve all people, all abilities, and we try to use as many art forms as possible. So this is just a clip from last year's programming, and you'll see there's music, ceramics, painting, dancing, drumming, ukulele, um, and lots of people at different stages in their work in this slide. Um, I'll reintroduce myself again. I use pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm the VP of programs at ArtMix. Uh, my background is in ethnomusicology, so I approach uh, my work at ArtMix really from a cultural studies standpoint and uh, a broad lens of what music, what art, what dance can really look like in all different types of culture. Um, it's really helpful with this lens because it also helps me think of disability cultures, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I'm a mental health self-advocate, so this organization is um, important to me and it's important to my family as well. And there are my contact details, which I'll share later. Um, I'm always open to chat with people because I love collaborating. Um, so today's presentation, I'll give you an intro to ArtMix, and then we're going to dive into some um, educational theories, the theory of multiple intelligences, we'll look at universal design for learning, and then I'm going to give an example of our programs of what accessible programming can look like um, at our, with our Arts for All Fest. 
then I've put together a list of some tips for making your programs and events more accessible. And then at the end of the slides are our slides from our friends at Easter Seals Crossroads, which Britt will go over about um, just assistive technology resources. So ArtMix um, was created with, an, uh, with the mission to transform the lives of people with disabilities through the creation of art. We were started in 1982, so we've been around now for over 40 years, and we were started to fill a need um, that actually still exists in the community, which is creating access to the arts for people with disabilities. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, and we do, I know this is a statewide webinar, so we do have accessible art studios downtown in Indianapolis, and then we do off-site programming around the state, around the state. Um, and really important to our mission is a philosophy of inclusion. So Art Mix programs are open to people of all abilities, people with and without disabilities. And the idea is we're creating space for people to create together and connect um, through affinities like interest in art. Our core programming, um, we do a lot here with a small team. Um, we do community arts classes that are open to all ages, all abilities. Right now we're offering a ukulele class, a clay class, an open studio advanced class, um, and visual arts classes. We do the Urban Artisans Internship Program. And how could I do a slide without shouting out First Lady Michelle Obama here in the corner? Um, and we won an award for that program, and it teaches high school youth to um, gain workforce skills through the arts. Entrepreneur Artisans is our newest program um, geared towards young adults who are interested in pursuing careers in the arts. Our Art Mix Gallery is open every day that we're here and also every first Friday, and um, we have a new show every um, month, and that showcases ability. Um, and also provides people an opportunity to sell their artwork as an independent artist. Uh, we also have our artists in residence program, which is where we send teaching artists out into the state that can be at schools or parks or hospitals. Um, and we really tailor and work closely with our partners for that. Um, Arts for All Fest, which I'll talk about in Winterfest, are two free public events. And then we do special projects just to keep us on our toes. Um, we've done creativity kits for um, Riley Hospital, um, children for inpatient stays there. We have tons of free YouTube instructional videos that anyone can access at any point. We have um, creative collaborations, um, which are partnerships and events with other organizations, creative conversations, which are free worksheets that we can share with you all. Um, we do professional development like today's webinar and um, webinar um, professional development with IPS. And then one of our newest projects that we're working on, and Amelia, I see you on here, is our Disability Justice um, Book Club. So back, done talking about art mix, now we'll talk a little bit more about the good stuff. So um, Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences is not a new theory. It's been around for a long time. But it's really important in our programming because it puts the idea that everybody has a different way of showing intelligence and that we can um, access learning through lots of different ways. So in our programming, we try to incorporate this kind of design. What we see is that some people may have spatial intelligence, which is really looking at the world, have um, visual cues. Some people are kinesthetic learners. They really like to work their bodies and do things. Some people are musical learners. Some people are interpersonal or intrapersonal, meaning either you like to work with other people or you are really aware of your own needs and your own self. Um, and then linguistic is really just using your words. And naturalist, which is one that I really love, um, is understanding living things and reading nature. Um, so this is really at the foundation of our work. We try to touch upon a lot of these different intelligences and also approach our programs with knowing that everyone shows their intelligence in different ways. We also use um, universal design for learning, um, which is a really wonderful thing. So I'm going to start by just showing a quick video if I can do this. And... 
Let's see. Screen share gets a little scary right here. <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to pull it back up. And who does not like learning? This is Ken. Mm -hmm. and these are Ken's classmates. This is their teacher. He has a goal for them and has asked them all to follow the same path to reach that goal. Some of the students follow the path with no complications, easily and quickly reaching the goal. Some students may wander off the path and need additional assistance staying on track. For some students, however, the path is completely inaccessible, presenting barriers that make it impossible for them to reach the goal. This is where Universal Design for Learning comes in. UDL recognizes and values the variability that exists in students' backgrounds, abilities, and interests, and helps educators design curricula that removes barriers to learning. By providing different paths to reach the same goal, UDL supports the different ways in which learners take in information, express what they know, and engage in learning. Okay, so I'm going to... Whoops! All open online Universal Design for Learning This week, Andy Johnson provides an excellent overview of the UDL curriculum. Thank you for being patient. It started playing the next video on YouTube, which is a good thing to say that there are actually, if you follow this link, you'll see on this, um, it's called like open access education, I think, and they have videos on UDL. So if you want a deeper dive, there's like four, four videos that will take you into that programming. Um, so back to universal design. So we can think about universal design for learning and also uni universal design for architecture. Um, so I like to think about how accessibility helps everyone and use the example of curb cuts on a sidewalk. So when you go to Target and you see that there's a little curb cut, it's really helpful for someone who uses a wheelchair because they're able to pull up onto the curb cut and actually get into the store and get into the building. But having that universal design also helps other people. So it helps someone who has a cart, who is just pushing their cart up. It also helps someone who has a stroller who can now push their stroller up on the curb cut. Um, so using that kind of example, I always just really encourage people to think about designing your programs so that they really help everybody. When we really think about offering different ways of entering an, a program or entering learning or entering arts access, it really ends up helping a lot more people than you would expect. Um, UDL has a few essential core tenets. One is that learner variability is the norm. So we often often talk about neurodiversity, um, which just means really that there's not one perfect brain um, and that a lot of people have different um, neurological variances um, and people come with different life experiences, different cultures, uh, different backgrounds, and that all plays into learner variability. So really, um, when you're designing your programs, your art programs or your arts events, keeping that in mind, it's really important to emphasize learner engagement and choice. So paying attention to the ways that people can engage in art. For example, um, I may have a student in our programs who has a visual impairment and they can't necessarily see colors that they're painting. But one thing that we can do to kind of make our programs more accessible is add texture into the paints that are available. So coffee grounds mixed in with paint is the thing you can do. And then when you're actually painting, there's a texture element to it um, that allows people to access it. Um, Emphasizing choice is really important at our programs too. Um, and this can really help all education. So thinking about 
um, allowing your students or your participants to think about what interests them. Um, for us, that might be, we have a lot of folks who are really into anime right now. So like using that feedback to offer an anime course. Um, I had somebody reach out who wanted to learn ukulele because she didn't want to do visual arts. And so we offered that. So there are a lot of great ways to kind of engage folks, um, both at the beginning of programming and then as you go throughout ongoing through your programming. This should be an iterative process. It's not just like one thing is going to fix everything. This is a process that is ongoing. The other thing with universal design, which I'll have you think about in your own programs, is identifying the barriers to access. Um, in that video, we saw maybe the actual ramp or the actual path to the end goal was the barrier for access. And so then there were a few different options. And then you can identify creative alternative routes to access learning and to demonstrate what you learned. Um, so going back to an example in our programs, that might look like um, I have a student with a cognitive disability who actually is not reading. And so one way that I can provide different programming access is to provide um, verbal instructions, not just written instructions. And then showing what people learned, there are different ways to show that people have enjoyed or access the learning. They could maybe dance it out, they could write it out, they could sing it out. There are lots of different ways that you could show that. Let's see if I can get to our next one. All right, so why is this so important? Why do we think about access and inclusion? I'm guessing that most of the people who are here or watching later have already decided this is important. So yay for being here, give yourselves a pat on the back. Um, but according to the CDC, it's estimated that one in four, every four Hoosiers is a person with a disability. And it's actually a little bit higher percentage than one in four. So it's actually 27% of the Indiana state population is a person with a disability. So um, you are absolutely serving people with disabilities in your programming. Um, you may, may or may not know that already. And I always want to remind people that um, disability is not homogeneous. So that means that like everyone's disabilities show up in different ways. So for example, we can think about what are invis invisible disabilities, which are things that are not immediately apparent. Um, this could be things like mental health needs um, or um, epilepsy, autism, things that don't necessarily show up right away are not as visible. Um, and then think about when you're talking about disability culture, I like to just think of it in the plural. So it's disability cultures, not necessarily disability culture. So 27% of, was it 6 million, over 6 million people in Indiana is a lot of people, and there's going to be a lot of variance. Remember, um, in our programming, we see a lot of multiple disabilities can coexist at the same time. Not everyone experiences the same disability in the exact same way. Um, so someone with epilepsy can have a different uh, version of epilepsy than someone else with that same diagnosis. Um, as I already said, disabilities can be invisible. And then I always like to remind us to empower people to self-advocate and myself included. So making space for people to use their own voices, um, not necessarily just jumping in um, to help because we don't necessarily know the best thing to do. Um, for everyone. And that's why it's really important to make room for the voices of self-advocates and to make room to ask questions and learn. And then an example I always like to think about is just considering deaf culture. So deaf people who are deaf do not all consider themselves as having a disability or as disabled. Um, deaf culture has its own language, ASL. It has even its own art forms. There's dip hop, which is deaf hip hop. Um, so it has all the tenets of uh, looking at a culture just like we would look at like Irish culture, for example. Um, and there are often ways that in deaf culture, they talk about um, the hearing world as being kind of a different culture as well. So just being sensitive to our language, our use, and then um, people's own empowerment to um, voice their needs and their cultures.
so I'm going to show you an example of what accessible programming could look like. And what I've chosen is our Arts for All Fest. So this is a free festival we hold every year. Um, a very interesting little piece of history is that Art Mix sound started as a festival, which I think is really beautiful because festivals are a really great place for us to um, think about community inclusion, to bring people together and to kind of level the playing field. Um, and to create uh, what Victor Turner called a sense of community task. So we're literally just building community through festivals. Um, this is inclusive for people with and without disabilities. And one way that we've just tried to build in universal design is creating different um, creation stations throughout the festival. So someone can come into the festival and they can try different art forms and it's kind of a pop-in model. Um, so we have music, if that is something that people really like. We usually have dance, uh, theater, clay, painting. Last year we had wire sculpture and embroidery, um, yoga, chalk art, all different types of things that are available. And so by creating um, just different pathways to engagement, different pathways to creative expression in this one event, we're really creating more of a universal design for access. Um, just other notes is that like from an event planning standpoint, we also have a resource fair, which is a way that as an organization, we can connect our community to additional resources. I think last year we had um, groups like Indiana Youth Group there, um, Indiana Disability Justice, um, Gleaners Food Bank, different community partners where people can really just access more information. And uh, we have free food, which is just, I think, a little bit of Hoosier hospitality that we like to provide some access to folks um, to come and eat and just feel in community. And like I said, why festivals? Because community inclusion really matters and it makes a difference. Um, so we have that kind of basic design for just different levels of access. And then you can go even further into your programming access by using adaptive tools and techniques. And we'll hear a little bit more about this when Britt talks um, about Easter Seals programming, but I've just shown a few examples of what adaptive tools look like in our art studios. So um, this first picture with a woman who's bending down, she's using, uh, this is Emily and she's using our arts for all equipment with one of our students, Amber. So this is a really cool piece of equipment that's essentially like a big paint roller, but you can put stamps on it. And then it has a little um, tray that you pour uh, acrylic paint into, and then you can roll it across a big canvas. And I'll show you in a little bit that it can also actually um, attach to someone's wheelchair. It can be used by people who are standing, it can be used by people who are sitting, and there are different levels of access. So it's a really, really fun um, tool. Then we also see a young man here using the Arts for All equipment that's attached to our chalk roller. So he's using a stand-up wheelchair and he's actually able to um, hold that roller. It is reinforced with a bar on his wheelchair, but he's actually um, controlling his own wheelchair and using the, the chalk to create his own design, which is pretty cool. And then you um, adaptive equipment can be even more simple and affordable. So on the corner here is a, an Abila grip um, attached to a foam paintbrush. So this is just an extra tool that can help someone um, with limited mobility in their hands grip the paintbrush. Um, again, it can help someone who um, even like folks with arthritis might like Abila grips and you can find them on Amazon pretty affordably. This one, I think we actually even made our own adaptation. We put the hole right in the middle of it <laughs> instead of like on the end of it, because that like helped one of our students even more. Um, so like just being creative is a really good approach to it. So I'm gonna show you what that Arts for All equipment looks like in use. Can you all see that video fine? Okay. So he... His dad is pushing him. And he got to choose his colors and his space.
what's cool about that is that I think those are also his siblings um, co-creating on the same mural. So um, this was a, a way that he was able to participate in this kind of outdoor activity. This was a fun event and there was a full day of painting on this canvas and repainting on this canvas. So you'll see it got um, lots of fun colors, fun but color. really it was about the process. Uh, this is another example of the Arts for All equipment being used. It's actually being used a little bit earlier in the day. This is actually our teaching artist, Johnson Simon, in the chair testing out the equipment. Um, he's a disability self-advocate and a really fabulous artist and a great teacher. So the fun thing about this is that he actually is asking the volunteer to like um, do wheelies with him or do, yeah, do donuts on it. So you'll hear that. <laughs> so um i just like i love that particular video too because i think johnson is giving a good demonstration of like he's He's asking the volunteer to point him in the direction he wants to go. Um, he got to choose the color. He's he's telling him to do donuts because that's the design he wants to see. So again, it's a really good opportunity to think about how you can um, listen to people's own voice and creative expression in your programming rather than kind of assume um, how they want their art to appear. Um, so I put together, and I'm, I'm happy to share these slides with folks afterwards, because I know it's a lot of information, it comes at you fast, and this stuff takes a long time. I've been doing this work for 10 years, and um, I, I wouldn't expect everybody to kind of um, create a total accessible program on their first try. It is something, again, that takes a lot of um, practice and learning and just willingness to be open and creative and listen. Um, so the first thing I would say is really important is to create space for people to request their own accommodations. We do this in our online registration forms for events and for our programming. Um, and so we leave a kind of a blank space to say, just describe any accommodations you need. I think the IAC is really good about doing this too. I've noticed on your webinars and registrations as well. Um, so example of accommodations might be like an ASL interpreter or large print programs, sensory rooms. Sometimes I get students who want to be able to leave the art classroom to cool down if they need to, and that's totally fine. Um, and we have space for that. No strobe lights is another one that we get, which is just um, in designing our shows, can we make them as inclusive as possible? And wheelchair access um, is also another big one for us. You can coordinate with self advocates like Courtney, who's going to talk next, um, and other experts for their input. And then I will also say compensate them fairly for their emotional labor and knowledge. Um, this is just really important to think about. Um, a lot of people maybe will ask for things for free, but this is work, and people have put a lot of work into developing their expertise. Um, so just think about um, ways that you can kind of build that into your program budget. Um, provide information about what to expect. So this is actually one of those tips that I think really helps everyone. Again, so imagine you have a student who's coming who is on the autism spectrum and really wants to know what is my first day going to be like at this class. Um, you can provide what are called social stories, um, which kind of ex walks you through what to expect on the day. But again, this helps everyone for someone with anxiety, knowing ahead of time where to park and what the this building setup might also be really helpful and might eliminate one of those barriers that would have stopped them from coming. Again, reduce barriers as much as you can. Um, stages with wheelchair ramps so your performers can come up. Um, transportation access. Are you on a public bus route? Um, do you have transportation available if you're 
um, I've been to some fundraisers where like the parking was miles away <laughs> from um, the event and you need to take a shuttle. So is your shuttle available and does it allow for someone who uses a wheelchair to access it? Um, and then think about ticket costs as well. We keep our programs free for a reason. Um, we know that um, folks who receive disability benefits may or may not um, be on a limit for how much income they're allowed to take in each year. And so sometimes things that are seen as like, I hate the idea, but things that are seen as extra like art aren't necessarily um, compensated for. So think about ways that you as an organization can create that access. Again, it will help everyone to keep your programs affordable. For us, we do a lot of programs for free, a lot of events for free. And then for our programs that are ticketed, we have sliding scale tuition. We eliminate the need for folks to provide really extensive background information to access scholarships. Um, so we don't ask you to fill out a really intense form. We just ask you to ask for a scholarship if you need it. And we make that really um, as easy as possible. Um, provide provide multiple ways for people to engage with the program. So I think just thinking about engaging multiple senses and multiple art forms is a really great way to frame that in your head. Um, be kind and ask for consent to help. I just read a really great book um, called Sitting Pretty by a woman and she was a whole chapter who's a disability self-advocate and there's a whole chapter on the complications of kindness and she gives really weird really important examples of how um folks kind of assume the help that she needed um instead of just asking her for help and trusting that she was willing to say what kind of help she needed um, again this is good practice for everybody but it's it's especially good um, within working with folks with disabilities and then ask for feedback and don't be afraid to keep learning and improving. Um, it's hard to sometimes ask for programming and event feedback. I know people pour, the, pour their hearts into them, um, but just being afraid, not being afraid of that um, opportunity to learn and grow is really wonderful. And then utilize many of the resources that already exist um, that you'll see a little bit more of, but also I'm here to chat anytime people want. Um, and there are a lot of good things that I can point you in the direction of. So for the interest of time, because I know there are others, <laughs> um, I'm going to skip over this. But um, as you look through the slides, this is just a thought exercise for you all to think about in your own programming. And if we have time, we can share some ideas together. But just think about some of the barriers that your attendees experience in your program and event. And what are some creative solutions to help increase their access? And then think about like two to three ways that one person can demonstrate that they've understood or enjoyed a program. So that's for your own brain um, after this webinar, let it um, brew in a little bit. And then I will say, um, shameless plug that our Arts for All Fest is coming up in September. So it's free and accessible for everyone. We'll have um, a registration link soonish. And um, I hope to see as many of you as possible. And um, community partners are welcome as well um, to share resources. So if you have any questions, you want to chat or grab a coffee, email me. I'm a way better emailer than I am a phone caller. So um, reach out to me and I'd love to chat more about your programming and um, ways we might collaborate. I'm going to stop my share and turn it over to Courtney. Hey, Britt, um, what do you, you want me to talk about? <laughs> well, Courtney, we're going to talk a little bit about, so Lydia, thank you so much um, for, for your presentation. That was wonderful. And that, yeah, Courtney, that leads to you. So we talked a lot about self-advocates and engaging self-advocates in the planning process. And Courtney, I know that you are amazing at helping organizations plan. So would you mind sharing a little bit about like the work you've done with the Indiana mm -hmm. Repertory Theater and maybe how to <clears throat> recruit you or your organization for a focus group? So um, I, as Britt said, I work for um, so if I have with Indiana, we are an organization, nonprofit organization run, run by, run for and by people with disabilities. Um, and we, uh, we have our picnic coming up, which is a 
which is a really inclusive, awesome time. We have food. Um, we have um, a DJ. We have a whole lot of things. And we try to make it as inclusive and as accessible for all abilities, for everybody. Um, I'm trying to think. And then, um, as Rick also said, I we Self Advocates of Indiana has uh, started a partnership with the Indiana Repertory Theater. Um, they asked us to come in and um, um, see what they would need as accessibility, um, how they could make their program more accessible, um, like sensory issues and what have you. And then, um, wow, let's see. What else, what else? We do a lot and I'm trying to rack my brain. Um, and you can also, um, um, to get, um, to get a hold of me to ask me to do things, you can contact uh, Becky Shields at the Ark of Indiana. She's our uh, the self advocates of Indiana admin. She and she will gladly reach out to me um, or Britt even. Um, she has my email, so. I'll definitely share that. And Courtney, um, you have been a part of many focus groups where people with disabilities um, help organizations make their organization more accessible. Can you talk about just some things that you've seen maybe in your experience that organizations haven't thought of that are accessibility um, issues that you see quite frequently? Like, um, of course, like, ramp access and like just um accessibility access like even for me going to restaurants where people park over the over the sidewalk so you you, you don't have a whole lot of space to go for your chair to go over the across the sidewalk even to walk go, walk across or um um I often work downtown and in Indy and a lot of the um curb cuts are like broken and they're like because of that they're kind of unstable so they're they have cracks in them so the wheelchair kind of goes in different ways because of that um but the Indiana Repertory Theater, one thing I did recognize and a lot of the officers recognize is they have, um, they made you aware of their sensory, um, sensory, um, how do I describe it? They're, what they already do and they have, they have um, flashlights. They have people up in front that hold flashlights in the, They'll flash it um, when a sensory uh, thing is coming up, like a gunshot or something in their shows, so that whoever has sensory issues is aware of that. Um, and I'm trying to think of more stuff. Um, yeah. Well, that's a lot of really great ideas yeah. and lots of great things yeah. to share. So thank you. Yeah. Um, what about with festivals, Courtney? We, we've talked a little bit about festivals and outdoor festival season. If anybody's planning an outdoor event or a festival style event, do you have any tips for them on making it more accessible or things um, that they should consider? I would, I would honestly make sure that it's um, zero entry, meaning that it has... Like it's all flat surfaces, no. Um, and I know this is hard to control because, um, especially in parks, but making sure like it's not a heavily rooted area because, 
um, a lot of your participants might be on walkers and wheelchairs and roots and wheelchairs and walkers don't really mix so um and make sure that like the the bathroom facilities are within like a um short shorter distance so if they or let them know where they they are because then the walkers or the wheelchairs would know which ones which and which ones are accessible um that's all i can think of um um that we consider um that's awesome is there anything else you want to share with the group and i will if you're okay with it make sure that i share your contact information um, um, so people can get in touch with you i'm i'm good i'm good so. okay thank you courtney i know you have a yeah. lot of stuff going on so if you have to leave that's okay we're good we're good i'm good yeah okay good thank you i appreciate it thank you all right, Lydia, you want to pull up those uh, last slides for us? Thank you. Okay, so as you are making, uh, you're planning your programming, and you probably saw on Lydia's slide, oh my gosh, that's a lot of assistive technology. I don't really know. Um, you know exactly where to go to get that. I don't know uh, who to contact to find that. Um, our friends at Easter Seals are fantastic people to talk to about this. So what is assistive technology? Lydia touched on it a little bit. Assistive technology, AT, is any item, piece of equipment, software program, or product that is used to improve or maintain functional capabilities of a person with disabilities. So it can include low tech or high tech assistive technology. Um, this includes large print, like we discussed before, pencil grips, we showed a paintbrush one, but very similar, armrests, handheld magnifiers, et cetera. Um, some high tech assistive technologies might be text to speak devices, augmentative communication devices, speech input software, and environmental controls. So we can go to the next slide. So how do we spread the word about AT? Um, basically, if you are wanting to get a hold of some assistive technology or you want to rent some for upcoming programs or events, you can call the number here and we'll make sure we share these slides or email tech at eastersealscrossroads.org. There is also a YouTube channel um, that has some tech tip videos and they upload a new one every Monday. So that's pretty helpful too, if you're new to this world. Um, and then we can go ahead to the next one. I'll let you watch the YouTube link on your own. I'm not that techy. Um, <laughs> training wise, there are some trainings coming up. So there is a full day assistive technology 101 training that's an online training on July 27th. Um, they also have September 7th and 8th, a training that is specifically assistive technology geared towards individuals with autism. Um, and so registration opens up one month before the event. So if the event is on July 27th, it'll open up on June 27th. So feel free to register. And then you can also sign up for their emails below. We're good to go. Thank you. And one of the coolest things about our friends at Easter Seals, and I really love this, is they have an equipment lending library. So anybody, any person or organization can borrow AT equipment if they are a Hoosier, I should say. Um, and they can borrow it for free for 30 days, which is pretty cool. So you can use equipment, like one of the examples that they gave is say that you just wanna test out some equipment to see if it would be of good use before purchasing it, you're able to do that. And they have over 2,500 devices available um, for loan. And they also um, have a list of all the equipment available in the Easter Seals Tech 
library. So we will make sure you have access to that too. I will say, because we've been asked a couple of times, this does include ramps. So you are able to rent um, ramps for your programs too. So say you're having a music festival like the Harrison Center just had here, uh, you would be able to rent a ramp to use for the day for your stage, and then you'd be able to return it, which is pretty wonderful. And I think that was it. Yeah, so we'll make sure that you have access to all of that. Um, and if you have any questions, um, Nicole at Easter Seals is great. And I'll make sure that you have her contact info too. But that's just a good place to get started if you are wanting to learn more. Um, does anybody have any questions? It looks like we have a little bit of time left over. And feel free to add them to the chat box if you don't want to to speak to the group. Something that um, I always think about is captions and how those help a large segment of the disability and non-disability community. Everyone benefits from captions. That's one of those things. Um, Lydia or Britt or Courtney, do you want to talk about how you've utilized captions in the past or how you've seen them successfully used at arts events? Um, I know um, at like the uh, Governor's Council for Disabilities Conference, they use them. Um, they always make sure that like, that the like transcriber can keep up because that's the important thing the who's ever transcribing there can keep up in here just as much as you know the person seeing it visually because they don't want to mess up the what people are saying but um and SAI uses them for zoom and and stuff because I we have a I have a we have a person on the board right now that she's she's visually impaired and she's um so she uses screen reader and that kind of stuff so we we've gotten um used to uh reading stuff for her or she she has a screen reader but um those are important for her to utilize as well so Yeah, I guess I thought of like um, our YouTube videos too. YouTube has like a, a way you can automatically add captions, but <laughs> you can go back in and edit them because captions are not always right. Or, yeah, they're um, not. <laughs> and they can be uh, hilariously bad sometimes. So like um, taking that extra time to edit captions is really good. Um that's what I think of. And like, I watch movies with my <laughs> subtitles on all the time to help me focus. And I, I would love to see maybe some of our film fests um, using captioning or app offering that um, for folks, um, just kind of even the smaller organizations providing that access because it does help a lot of people. I use them because I fall asleep. So if I fall asleep, then I can go back and turn them back on. That's a good idea. Stephanie, you mentioned screen readers too. One of the things that I've learned over the past couple of years is to make sure that your um, websites and resources that you have are downloadable and or in word text and not just in PDF so that somebody utilizing a screen reader, um, they're able to read your captions on your photos, that sort of thing. So that's just kind of an easy tip that was something mm -hmm. that like Lydia said, I've been in this industry for 10 years and I just learned that last year. So make sure that you're not just putting things in PDF format because then a screen reader can't read it. That's interesting. I think one of my thoughts is this is the type of work where there is no end to it. It's always, there's always more, there's always, and not in a way that's like, oh, well, there's always more. I'm never going to be great at this. This That's depressing. But no, but in a way of like, there's always more to grow. There's always more to learn. There's always mm -hmm. more um, connections you can make with people by, by cre creating a more inclusive environment. That's just bringing more people into the work you're doing. And how great is that, that we can mm -hmm. um, continue to improve our 
our offerings so that more people can access them. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So in that way, where do you guys look when you're looking to get some professional development or grow in your understanding or what's next for you? What would you like to improve upon in, in your understanding of accessibility? So much, so much, my gosh, the list is, I think one of the things that our team is really wonderful about here and I've learned so much about um, over the past few years is thinking about the emotion side of disability mm -hmm. and not just the practical, you know, ramps and, and braille and text mm -hmm. side of things, but also yeah. thinking about meeting people where they're at with their emotional capacity, um, talking about stressors, talking about grief, talking about these things that when you're a part of the disability community, you're dealing with and going through, but also we all are, right? It's just a part of life. Um, so more trainings on that, more trainings on compassion fatigue, um, more trainings on gosh, critical thinking, disability theory, uh, cultures of disability, more training on, I mean, these are just all the things that like I want to do. So please feel free to interrupt. <laughs> but, um, more <laughs> trainings on use of adaptive technologies, um, not just from the educational side, but also from the performing arts side. So um, my husband is a performing artist, and I think every time I go to a performance, I'm thinking, oh, what if a musician had a disability, and how would they be able to get on stage, and how would they be able – I want to learn more about that. I want to, mm -hmm. to, to know more about that. Um, so, yeah, that's my little list, but that's just me. I know that self-advocates, um, we've been really – have or we've really tapped into um, – as as professional information, um, just being more geared, especially after COVID, mental health, because we've looked at what it's looked like for for our self advocates to be stuck inside. Um, I think I mentioned to Brit, um, last time that I was stuck in the house for 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 not one hundred and fifty days, and I was about ready to. Pull my pull my hair out, um. But but because those self advocates lose when you lose your your well, you lose your services for a little while. You kind of don't know what to do with yourself. Um, um. You lose your access to your friends. You lose your access to your transpo. I mean, it it can be very um detrimental to mental health and i know we at self advocates tried to do some like zoom get together stuff and just try to keep people connected that way cuz that way they were able to talk with friends and 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 be involved and connect and not feel like they're losing that opportunity with people. Thank you. So. Mm -hmm. Lydia, did you want to share? Yeah, I think like even what Courtney was saying, the, the pandemic did bring to light a lot of access issues. It also created some opportunities when things moved to Zoom um, and online mm -hmm. for extending access, but like that mm -hmm. kind of um, the social isolation that you're describing, Courtney, is also something that we've seen a lot um, in our programming and a lot of people wanting to come back right. and, and right. be in person for those right. reasons. Yeah. Um, I think like for us as an organization too, I'm really interested in learning more about inter intersectionality and disability studies. So like um, looking at the intersections of race and disability, gender identity, sexuality and disability and how these <laughs> Um, ways that people are marginalized are compounded and um, mm -hmm. there's some really amazing work being done in disability justice so even just like googling that term can take you to great resources and great people to learn from um, mm -hmm. I turn to the Kennedy Center a lot for professional development because they have free webinars um, well they're free once you hit a <laughs> you join their access but um, 
yeah, reach out to me if you have questions about any webinars. Um, and um, they have a lot of good free, well vetted resources on their website. Um, and then looking at other disability organizations is really fun for me <laughs> to continue like growth and learning. There's an organization called Creative Growth in Oakland, California that just does some really cool partnerships and some really cool um, structures for programming. So again, there are already so many creative people out there doing this work and have been doing it for a long time. So just being willing to like follow their Instagram and, and see how they're doing it or reaching out and having a conversation is a great way to learn. Um, there is the LEAD conference in Boston this year, which is another great gathering of folks um, for professional development. So I'll be going there. Um, and then in universities, there's usually disability studies um, within all different universities that have great resources um, written by self-advocates that's always changing and always growing. Um, and inviting people in for focus groups is something that I'm really interested in doing. So if people are interested in coming, just reach out to me. Um, and then I just want to add by saying like, this stuff is so exciting to me because it really accessibility does make the world a lot better. Um, if you think about texting, which I bet everyone on this call uses every day, um, that was invented by a person who was deaf. Um, so there are really great ways where assistive tools can help make the world better for everyone. So just being open to that and really opening to learning um, really helps me. Awesome. Um, I, I, I've said this on previous webinars, but at the IEC, we're always also thinking about being um, more accessible, more inclusive. Something we do every year is set goals at the beginning of every year in January just three simple things we wanna try and explore for the year and expand in different directions, things that make the most sense based on the programming we're doing this year, the community we're trying to reach out to, things that align with our strategic plan, and then find ways to make those more accessible step-by-step. Step. Like for example, you know, this is a stretch goal, but I wanna learn more about plain language um, for people with intellectual disabilities. There's a whole language or a mm -hmm. strategy of creating more plain, straightforward language. And it, yeah. if you've ever filled out a government form, you know we're about the farthest thing from plain language. And that is my stretch goal is to challenge myself to learn more about that and then try and see where, um, if not everywhere, but where we could apply that in the work we're doing to make it more accessible. And, and my hypothesis is that that will make it more accessible for everyone mm -hmm. um, to from a government document into something more plain language. So that's like, hopefully, you know, a stretch goal I'll, I'll get, um, I'll spend time investing in professional development around that and thinking around that. And that's the thing that um, maybe in a couple of years we'll have uh, some, some tangible, really good um, outcomes from it. But that's something I'm focused on. All right, we're wrapping up. Any final thoughts or questions? I know that like at SAI, we rely heavily on plain language because um, a lot of our self-advocates are, are, are different mental capa like cap capabilities. And a lot of times we get asked, can this be in plain language or first person language or whatever language so it's more understandable so we've you know come to the table with different organizations and been like and they've asked us how do we make this more concise into a plain language kind of format for people that's great i should use self-advocates as my uh <laughs> one of my resources for this work thank you courtney you're welcome well, I want to thank you, Courtney, Lydia, and Britt, and all of Art Mix for being here today. Thank you so much. Um, Britt, did you have something to close it out, or are we are we good? That's it. Just keep learning, keep growing. Like Lydia said, keep your mind open, and it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to learn. We all learn every day, um, and it's okay to ask. So if you need help, ask anybody on this call. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'll make sure you have our contact info. I will also be happy to be Courtney's assistant and relay conversations <laughs> to her as well. 
And um, I hope to see some of you out at some of our events. So Self Advocates Picnic is actually usually one of my favorite events of the year. Yes, I enjoy it a lot. So excited. It's fun. We're so um, excited. Yeah. And Arts for All Fest. And let us know what you're doing. Let us know what events you have coming up because we want to be there. Thank you so much. Thanks to our Art Mix friends and all of our speakers today. Um, we will share out this recording and some supplementary materials in a follow-up email next week. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Thank you.